the first uh, question obviously is can we demonstrate from the composition that it's material that is not from the solar system and you know by studying the elements studying the radioactive isotopes we could even date the material how old it is and we are now engaged in that process uh on the day we came back uh we stopped at uc berkeley to do preliminary analysis but now most of the material is being analyzed at harvard university and i just a, a couple of days ago i sent some of it to the brooker corporation in germany so we have independent people looking at uh, those materials and you know these are really experts uh, in terms of studying such uh, such uh, spherules and um, i hope to have results by the end of this month and they will be reported in a scientific paper the preliminary analysis and yeah. then of course we'll continue to analyze it uh, using you know imaging devices like an electron microscope to get a sense of what these ferrules look like um, we will also analyze the composition using a mass spectrometer and other devices and um, you know the uh, it will become clear within a few weeks whether the material is from outside the solar system then the second question the next question and I have uh, more is, questions too by the way <laughs> sorry I said I'm sorry pardon me I said I have some questions as well too but go ahead well the second question is whether the uh, materials uh, were made by a technological civilization that's mm -hmm. obviously the more interesting question and um you can imagine droplets of uh, for example semiconductors they would have rare elements that are much more abundant than you find in nature uh so we shall see what what we find please uh, go ahead ask me questions oh sure um so the well i should say um first of all that uh, admiral Gal uh, galadet um i was thrilled to hear that he was part our this is our last guest i was thrilled to hear that he was part of the Galileo, Galileo project. And uh, what a, you have built such a great team. I just wanted, wanted to say that um, of all the people you have involved and you're able to raise money, which is really unusual in this type of situation. And, you know, and um, as I said in, through an email that, you know, you found the needle in the haystack, you had the open-mindedness and I really, really appreciate, and I know a lot of other people appreciate um, your willingness to take this topic seriously and really look at it. So the questions, um, is this, well, first of all, I was kind of surprised that you're able to go exactly to the site um, where this thing landed and how, how was that recorded accurately enough for you to find something? Well, the U.S. government provided the location uh, in the NASA catalog of this meteor to within 11 kilometers. That was the uncertainty. That's a big region, the size of Boston. And uh, to find a millimeter size uh, spheral within a region of 10 kilometers is, uh, sounds like an impossible task. Uh, but we were able to localize it better by using seismometer data from a new island in Papua New Guinea. The seismometer recorded the sound wave, the blast wave that resulted from the explosion. And since the sound speed is much smaller than the speed of light, uh, it, there is a delay in the arrival time uh, of the sound wave to the seismometer. And from that delay, knowing the speed of sound, we were able to figure out how far away the explosion wow. was Isn't that and that allowed us to narrow down the path the likely path of the meteor to within a kilometer or so and that's the region that we focused on and indeed we found most of the spherules in that region uh, we also checked the control regions far away just to demonstrate that we don't see the same concentration of spherules there how about that that's really amazing and um, is it possible, or has there been any type of argument that the speed of this thing could have been caused by some other type of situation, like some type of slingshot effect or something? Um, well, the, the chance speed. of um, the chance of of course, everything is possible. But to get a slingshot, uh, you need to range for very rare circumstances where you have two massive objects that are moving uh, near each other, and then this 
this interstellar object is passing in between them so that they kick it uh, gravitationally. That is possible, but <laughs> it's very unlikely because most of the objects in interstellar space do not originate from a slingshot. They originate from a common source because these are the most abundant. So to find the first one uh, to originate from a very rare arrangement where you have two massive objects e ejecting uh, an interstellar object is, is unlikely. Uh, it's possible, but then you have to explain why would this be common? Why would most interstellar objects originate from slingshots? Why not from the Oort clouds of stars where we have a huge number of rocks and they can be dislodged very easily by a passing star? These are the mm -hmm. most common environments. You have lots of rocks in the solar system at 100,000 times the Earth-Sun separation. They are very loosely bound to the Sun. They are, their typical orbital speeds are uh, 100 times smaller than uh, the motion, the, the speed of the Earth around the Sun. So they are very loosely bound and a passing star can easily dislodge them. You would expect most interstellar objects to originate from the outskirts of planetary systems like the solar system, because it's easy to kick them out by passing stars. I see. And uh, imagining a situation where you have, for example, two stars close together, and from their vicinity within this tiny compact en environment, you eject most of the interstellar object, that would be, you know, a very unlikely proposition, uh, because most of the rocks reside in the outskirts of planetary systems like uh, the solar system. So um, it's possible, but it's unlikely. Uh, and the, uh, you know, it's, it's also possible that somehow the first interstellar object belongs to 5% of the population of stars, that it came from you know, an unusual outlier. But that would be, again, unlikely. Um, mm -hmm. And why would it have material strength that is higher than the typical space rocks that we find in the solar system. You need to explain two facts in the first interstellar meteor. So, um, you know, it's possible that there are some astrophysical environments that produce a lot of objects and they are, these environments are very different than the solar system, of course. So then we will learn something new about natural incubators or environments that generate, produce such objects. That would be new knowledge, which would be very interesting. Yes. Uh, however, it's also possible that we are dealing with a technological object. Uh huh. Now they obviously carry some iron in them to be picked up by the magnet, right? Yes. No. I mean, <laughs> the iron uh, we detected directly by putting the spherules inside an X-ray fluorescence analyzer, which is basically a device that shines X-rays, just like when you go in the airport, you pass your luggage through X-rays. Uh, and so this device shines X-rays on the spheral, and the X-rays penetrate about 100 micro microns, a tenth of a millimeter, through the surface. And uh, whatever atoms exist in that layer that is being exposed to the um, X-rays, these atoms get excited, the electrons get excited and they radiate on their own uh, spectral lines, which are the fingerprints of the elements that they make the surface of the spheral. And so we were able to infer the composition of the surface of the spherules uh, of a few of them on the ship. And we saw that uh, most of them have uh, mostly iron. Uh, basically something like 84% or so. So, and that explains why they were magnetic. Uh, and of course we were worried that perhaps the materials will not be magnetic. We had a sluicing device, which uh, is being used to find gold, for example, and uh, based on the density of materials that distinguishes them from the background. And we used it only once, but as soon as we started collecting spherules, we realized that we have spherules, we decided to stop using the sluicing device and just focus on getting as many spherules as possible so that we can uh, analyze the composition of the object uh, to a better precision. Now, do these things, are these things spherical, perfectly looking spherical, 
um, because of a, a gravity t situation. I'm trying to figure out, I know, I know if something's like, doesn't have any gravity around it, it'll become completely spherical, I would imagine. Um, no, no, actually. Uh, gravity plays no role in tiny objects. Gravity plays a role in objects, the mass of the earth or bigger. Uh, but if you consider millimeter size object, the, gra the self gravity of the object is practically negligible. Okay, oh. so it, it's so not it keeping mean? itself bound by gravity. It's keeping itself bound by chemical uh, bounds, you know, the binds, binding energy between atoms. That's what keeps it together. Um, uh, so it's not gravity. And then uh, what makes it spherical is um, the surface tension. You know, it minimizes the energy, just like a droplet of, uh, of rain. You know, why is a droplet of rain roughly spherical? Because there is surface tension. It's just like soap I bubbles. See. If you look at the soap bubble, uh -huh. it looks uh, reasonably spherical. So there is um, the, the uh, fluid tries to minimize the amount of energy by keeping itself spherical because bigger you know uh, different structures would have more surface tension uh, more surface area you will need more energy to sustain them and and a system prefers to go to the lower lowest energy state so it relaxes to the minimum energy configuration which ends up being spherical it has nothing to do with gravity it has to do with tension on the surface related to chemical bonds okay and okay. Uh, so just like uh, raindrops um, there is also the effect of friction on the air that they could give it a slightly egg-shaped uh, structure. But we also saw um, droplets that solidified as soon as they merged, but before the merger product became spherical. So if they solidify just at the point of contact, you end up with a, a lopsided uh, object that has, you can see the original uh, spheres coming together. We saw one, one example of that. And also, <clears throat> when we imaged at UC Berkeley one of the spherules, uh, we saw an amazing view um, that the spheral is made of spheres inside spheres. So sort of like Russian dolls. Ah. Uh, when we looked inside of it, yeah. and the smallest spheres were hundreds of atoms in size. Presumably, they solidified first and then they were engulfed by molten iron in a bigger droplet that uh, basically glued together the smaller spheres that condensed earlier. And then a bigger one <laughs> uh, came and, and contained all of those. So you end up with spheres inside spheres kind of configuration, which was really beautiful. How about that? And were you told, like, this is a crazy idea by your colleagues or, or anyone? To begin yeah, with. I mean, just uh, a week before we left, um, uh, one of my colleagues said, uh, oh, you, you know, many of us think that you will not find anything, that it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, and why would you do that? Uh, and I said, well, you know, I'm doing the heavy lifting here. I'm, I'm actually going to the Pacific Ocean uh, to search for the evidence. Um, you just sit back and relax. You don't have to do anything.